Today, from Philip DeCourcy on Know the Truth. So if I'm to know God, and that's one of the big priorities of my life, isn't it? God must be first in the worship of God, a priority. Then I need to know him. How do I know him? Through the scriptures. Listen, worship is always and must ever be a response to the truth of God's word. At church, we sing and learn about God, but if our hearts aren't in the right place, our worship falls flat. As creator, provider, savior, and all in all, God deserves to be front and center in our lives and in the church. And while that may seem obvious, making more of God and less of ourselves can prove to be a personal challenge. Happy New Year and welcome to Know the Truth. Today, Philip DeCourcy continues a study on the nature of true worship. Listen online at ktt.org. Here now is Pastor Philip. Let's take our Bibles and turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. We're learning again and afresh how we ought to worship God. Here Solomon is reminding us that the chief end of man is to glorify God. Here he's reminding us of the thing we need to major on. We need to major on God and the worship of God. God is above and before everything else. God is first, and if that's true, and it is true, then worship must be the overarching passion and priority of each of our lives. Worship is the first thing we should do when we come into God's presence. Psalm 100 and verse 4 says what? Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to the Lord and praise his name. We must at all costs avoid offering worship to God that's vain, empty, and lacking in meaning. And that's exactly what was going on here. They were worshiping vain, empty, religious activity to God that was unacceptable. And Solomon rebukes them. And he says, walk prudently when you come to the house of God. Draw near to hear rather than to give the sacrifices for fools, for they do not know that they do evil. Don't be rash with your mouth. Let not your heart utter anything hastily before God. For God is in heaven, you on the earth. Let your words be few. Speak less. And when you do speak, may there be more meaning and heart. To what you say. Their prayers were hollow. Their promises were empty. Their worship needed a tune up. So we must remind ourselves that we worship a sovereign God. Let's bring that back into our worship. Our worship, like their worship, is often out of place because God is not in his place. He's not high and lifted up in our minds. We don't find ourselves taken up by his nature and how awesome it is. That's a missing note in their worship, and it's a missing note in ours, and we need to remind ourselves that indeed God is sovereign. Let's be careful not to try and dethrone God. Go with me for a moment to 2 Timothy chapter 3, and we're warned by Paul that in the last days, There will be a godlessness that marks society, a self-centeredness. Man will be the measure of all things. And Paul says, in the last days, perilous times will come for men will be lovers of themselves. Go down to verse 4, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Tell me, is that what you're seeing all around you? Of course it is. Men are bowing down before the unholy trinity of me, my, and mine. They have made their desires and their dominion the focus. And that's what's happening outside the church. But as is always the danger, what happens outside the church can start happening inside the church. And we've got to be on guard because we're reminded here, God is in heaven. We're on the earth. He's sovereign That's the God we worship. And if that's the God we worship, he must be sovereign in worship. He must be at the center and circumference of all that we do. Worship is the glorification of God. 
It mustn't slip into a quest for human fulfillment. Savonarola was a 15th century preacher in Florence, Italy, and he observed one day an older woman worshiping at a statue of the Virgin Mary in the city's great cathedral. He saw her one day, he saw her the next day, and one day after that, and so on and so forth. He was so taken by this, and he assumed that this was an act of devotion. In fact, he brought her to the attention of his fellow priests. He said, look how she reveres the Virgin Mother. But one of the priests said, it's not what you think. Many years ago, an artist was commissioned to create a statue for the cathedral. He found a lovely young woman to be his model for the statue. That woman now worships that statue each and every day. Was the woman worshiping God? Not that worshiping Mary is worshiping God in the truest sense, but I'm using it as an illustration. Was this woman worshiping God or was she worshiping herself? Sometimes those lines get blurred, and they're being blurred in the church today. For a few moments, let me try and run this home, run this to ground. If God is to be sovereign in worship, what would that look like? First of all, it would mean that his glory and his pleasure is at the front and center of all that we do. We've said it, but I'll drill it home a little bit further. You and I need to awaken to the fact that our age is self-absorbed, man-centered. America is going under a Copernican revolution, philosophically speaking, where humanism, not theism, dominates the thinking of the day. And as a result, the culture has moved from a focus on the soul and the thought of the transcendent to a focus on self and an occupation with the material. Consequently, if society has any room for religion or any place for God, it has to be therapeutic in nature. That religion has to feed man's ego, man's emotions, man's expectations. If we let God hang around, he's got to be useful. That's the day we're in. That's society. But sadly, what's happening out there is starting to happen in here. And the gospel that's being preached from many pulpits is therapeutic, emotional, psychological, man-centered. It's about you finding your best life now. That's bad. That's bad because that means that the church has caved into the culture. The church has lost its perspective. The whole goal of many services today is to make people happy. The preaching is psychological, non-theological. The atmosphere is relaxed. The tone is positive. The songs are contemporary and have no link to the past. The seeker-sensitive service means minimizing church-related stuff. There's no intercessory prayer. There's no offerings taken. There's no communion on a regular basis. Why? Because everything is judged by the effect it has on men. Church leaders today don't meet to say, okay, what are we going to do this Sunday to attain to the advancement of God's glory and the extension of God's kingdom? No, they meet to say, what do we need to do or not do to draw a crowd? That's a tragedy. That's a travesty. God must be at the center of all that the church does. His glory, His name, His fame. The tabernacle geographically and strategically was at the center of the life and liturgy of the people of Israel. We need to come back to the heart of worship. It's all about him. Listen to John MacArthur in his book on worship. He says this, why do you go to church? Why do you meet together with the saints? Is it really to worship or do you go to church for what you get out of it? Do you come away having scrutinized the soloist, analyzed the choir and criticized the preacher? We've been too long conditioned to think that the church is there to entertain us, there to edify us. In the words of Kierkegaard, the philosopher, people have the idea that the preacher is an actor on stage and they are the critics blaming or praising him. What they don't know is that they are the actors on the stage. He is merely the prompter standing in the wings, reminding them of their lost lines, and God is the audience. It's true. And look at the way a modern evangelical service looks. It's all pointed towards the stage. It's very relaxed. The lights are dimmed down. The congregation's hardly ever seen. The spotlights are on the stage. 
All the actors are up there. And you are the critics gallery. Thumbs up, thumbs down. That was good, that was bad. And it all hinges on whether I felt it was good or whether it did me good. And MacArthur, through a quote from Kierkegaard, reminds us, he got it all back to front. The congregation's the actors. The preacher is the prompter reminding them of what they ought to be and do to the glory of God. And God is the audience. God is the critic. It has to meet with his approval. That's what a good worship service would look like if God is sovereign. Secondly, When God is sovereign in worship, our services will not be seeker-sensitive or driven, not evangelistic in focus primarily. We've already noted this. Worship is the church's priority, not evangelism. Loving God comes before loving your neighbor. Now, those things aren't in competition. If we're a worshiping congregation, we will be an evangelizing congregation because worship produces evangelism. It's a short step from loving God to loving your neighbor. Worship provokes evangelism. Worship and evangelism are not mutually exclusive. One feeds off the other, but one's before the other. Worship before evangelism. And that's why it's my conviction reading the New Testament that the early church met to worship. They scattered to evangelize. You can see that in words like Acts 2 that they continued in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, prayers. They met together in one place to do all those Christian activities. And then God gave them favor with the people. They were in favor with God, and God gave them favor with the people. They worshiped, and they evangelized in that order. We read in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 23, when you come together, one should pray, one should praise There was disorder in the church at Corinth. And Paul says, look, when you come together, get your act together. This worship is not that pleasing to God. The rich are overlooking the poor at the Lord's table, the agape feast. All sorts of things were going on. In fact, he uses a conditional clause. And if the unbeliever comes in, he's going to see disorder, which isn't a good witness. If the unbeliever comes in. That happens. Their services were public, much like ours. But the focus was on the believer, the church, the exaltation of God. Hebrews 10, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. But meet and stir one another up on the love and good works. Now, as you listen, you say, Pastor, it sounds awful like a holy huddle. Yeah, it is a holy huddle. If you're going to win the game, you need to huddle. Look at the football field. The team huddles. Calls are made. The quarterback gives direction. Then they break the huddle. They execute the play. They win the game. That's what the service is. It's our coming together. It's a huddling. It's a listening to and a looking for something from God so that we might do his will on the playing field of everyday living. Now, we've got to break the huddle. If all we do is meet and don't evangelize, if all we do is talk to each other and not to a lost world, then that is a holy huddle we should be embarrassed about. But of course the church is a holy huddle. It's a holy people meeting on a holy day to hear the holy scriptures that they might live holy lives. We mustn't forget that. That's what it's all about. I remember an old pastor saying to me as a young preacher back in Northern Ireland, he says, Philip, and he based this on Jesus' words to Peter, Peter, feed my sheep. Now, Peter was an evangelist also. He went out and reached the world for Jesus Christ. You hear him preaching in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost. But Peter was first and foremost a shepherd, a pastor within the church. And what was his calling? Feed my sheep. And this old pastor said to me as a young pastor, your job, Philip, is to feed the sheep, not entertain the goats. It's good advice. I've never forgotten it. And this thought that we're talking about here, it's a world away from the tailor-made evangelical mega churches, isn't it? Who actually poll people in their community as to what kind of church they want to come to. I mean, how ridiculous is that thought? That's like a doctor saying to you in his surgery, well, what's wrong with you and what do you want me to do about it? You know, self-diagnose yourself. Well, if you could do that, you wouldn't go to the doctors in the first place, would you? The whole point is the doctor knows what's wrong with you. 
The doctor knows what's good with you. And sometimes you have to hold your nose and take his medicine. My friend, the unsaved don't know what's good for them. It's a ridiculous exercise to go to the world and ask the world what they want from God. Because the God they love is not the God we love. It's a God made in their own image. And the church is now remaking God to suit that culture. Here's the last thought. When God is sovereign in worship, preaching will be central. God is in heaven. He's sovereign. He's above our scrutiny, our questions, our judgment. Therefore, let our words be few. Let our questions be fewer. And if we worship that God, then he's got to be smack dab in the middle of all that we say and do in his name. He's got to be sovereign in our worship, which means his glory comes first. It means that the church, when it gathers, is focused there. And finally, it means that preaching will be at the heart of what we do. And you say, why? And I'll tell you why. Because if we're going to know God, he has to make himself known, and he has. He has revealed his mind, and he's told us something of his heart in the Holy Scriptures. He's also supremely revealed himself in the coming of his son, Jesus Christ, when the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And so what are the scriptures? They're the promise of Jesus coming the first time and the promise of his coming a second time. From Genesis to Revelation, it's all about Jesus. God has revealed himself through Jesus Christ. And what we know of Jesus Christ has been revealed to us in the scriptures in a infallible, inerrant record of all that he has done. So if I'm to know God, and that's one of the big priorities of my life, isn't it? God must be first in the worship of God, a priority. Then I need to know him. How do I know him? Through the scriptures. Listen, worship is always and must ever be a response to the truth of God's word. There's no other way to worship. You can never separate the preaching of God's word from worship. Worship is prompted by the Word of God. Worship must be designed according to the Word of God, must follow the patterns of the Word of God. We cannot worship God aright without a proper understanding of Him, and we cannot properly understand Him apart from His Word read, taught, and understood. That's why in the midst of a culture that's in love with itself and a church that's in danger of apostasy and heaping to themselves teachers that tell them what they want to hear but not what they need to hear, what does Paul say to Timothy? This is the last charge that Paul will give. It's his last letter. What does he say? Preach the word. I charge you before the living God and Jesus Christ and his kingdom and appearing. This is what you need to do until Jesus comes back. Preach the word. It's the preaching of the gospel establishes the church. It's the preaching of the gospel that allows the church to be the church. And as we close, as we go for a landing, surely that is a mantle that the contemporary church needs to pick up. Our pulpits are weak, preaching anemic. Expository preaching is going out of fashion. We're into short sermons, trite sermons, topical sermons, feel-good sermons. By the way, thank you. Thank you for sitting under preaching that's solid and meaty and long. Because you see, where can we go? Christ alone is the words of life. I want to tell you something. We have forgotten in the evangelical church that nothing honors God more I want to say it again, nothing honors God more than the faithful declaration of his word and the obedient hearing of the truth. Psalm 38 verse 2, God has exalted his word above his name. Preaching is an act of worship. In fact, it's one of the highest forms of worship. And preaching produces acts of worship because it tells us of this one who has loved us in Jesus Christ in such an unmerited fashion, in such a marvelous way, as we get to know the one who has so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, do we not want to worship him? Do we not want to give our lives to the one who gave his life for us? Preaching is worship. Preaching produces acts of worship. 
John Wesley, the great Anglican preacher who founded the Methodist Church, wrote in the preface of a volume of sermons which he published in 1746. I am a creature of a day, passing through life as an arrow through the air. I am a spirit come from God and returning to God, just hovering over the great gulf. I want to know one thing, the way to heaven, how to land on that happy shore. God himself has condescended to teach that way. He hath written it in a book. Oh, bring me that book. I pray that you will ever pray that. I need to hear the word of the living God, a word which itself is powerful and living and brings life to those that obey its gospel and follow its commands. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, you are indescribable, uncontainable. Lord, your creation dwarfs us. We're minuscule in terms of its vastness, and yet you dwarf your creation. It's just an expression of your glory, the overspilling of your majesty. And yet, Lord, amidst this creation, amidst the stars, the swelling oceans, the mountainous regions of the world, we as men and women and young men and young women, we are those created in your own image, those who were made for fellowship and friendship with God, those made to reflect your glory and find our greatest joy in your joy. Lord, help us as men and women to realize that's the greatest thing about us. And that's what makes worship so important. Therefore, O oh God, this day, you are in heaven, we're on the earth. We thank you that Jesus Christ came from heaven to earth, that we might indeed know the God who is in heaven. Help us to love our Lord Jesus. Help us to worship you. Help us then to take this message to others who are in the world without God and without hope. Help us on a day-to-day -day basis to surrender all to the one who surrendered all for us. And these things we ask and pray in his name. Amen. Learning how to worship God from the book of Ecclesiastes. You're listening to Know the Truth with Philip DeCourcy and a message titled Watch Your Step from the Quest for the Best series. More online at ktt.org. At Know the Truth, we're passionate about proclaiming God's word with boldness, clarity, and conviction, and we're not alone. There are friends like you who come alongside us to bring Philip's teaching to the radio and the Internet. And one of the best ways you can make an impact is by signing up to become a Truth Ambassador. Your donation every month adds a greater level of stability to the ministry of Know the Truth. And when you become a Truth Ambassador, you'll have the satisfaction of knowing that you're helping us reach listeners like Susan, who wrote and said, I'm so thankful and inspired by Pastor DeCourcy's high standards, numerous references, and clear commitment to help me love God and want to serve with equally high standards. Thank you so much, and please keep broadcasting. Well, helping listeners like Susan is why we're here. And whether you sign up to become a Truth Ambassador or give a one-time donation, we'll say thanks for your support by sending you a timely resource on the book of Ecclesiastes titled Living Life Backward. If you want to dig deeper into this book of wisdom, this is the book for you. And if you sign up as a Truth Ambassador, you'll also receive a special welcome package, exclusive content from Pastor Philip each month, and a custom stainless steel Know the Truth travel mug. We'll put your resources in the mail when you make a donation by phone at 888-644-8811 or online at ktt.org. Well, I'm Wayne Shepherd, wishing you a happy new year. Join us tomorrow when Philip DeCourcy continues a study on worship. That's Tuesday on Know the Truth. Today's program was produced and sponsored by Know the Truth Incorporated. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free.